Welcome to the um, Concurrent Antitrust Code podcast. I have the pleasure here to uh, have uh, a podcast together with Andreas Mund, uh, President of the German Competition Authority, the Bundeskartellamt, and also Chair of the ICN Steering Group. Thank you very much for being with us. Yes, I'm happy to be here. So the first question I'd like to ask is about mergers. And in, in particular, you know, about five years have passed since um, uh, value-based notification thresholds were introduced in the legislation in Germany. And so I was wondering what is your feeling as to whether that instrument has been successful in general and in particular in achieving the initially stated goals, which were those of capturing potential killer acquisition, especially in the digital sector. Yeah. I mean, it is always difficult to e evaluate such a tool because uh, you have no idea which cases did not come to you as an agency because the tool was already in place. Uh, we evaluated this, uh, this threshold back in 2021 and the result, in fact, was together uh, with the Ministry of Economics that it, it was a helpful tool. Um, until the evaluation in 2021, we had round about 60 cases, which does not mean that we looked at 60 cases, because out of these 30 cases, out of these 60 cases, 30 cases turned out not to be notified at the Bundeskartellamt after consultation with us. So under scrutiny, in fact, there were only 30 cases. By the way, most of them not in the digital sector, but in the pharma sector and in other I would say innovative areas, but not so much in the digital sector where in fact it was, it was made for. So already from the figures you can see it was not a disproportionate burden uh, for companies or lawyers uh, that they had to file too many um, mergers. Well, was it successful? Um, if you look at the number of prohibitions, there was none. So you can say, well, uh, how can this be a success? On the other hand, as I said already, um, I'm pretty sure that there were good many cases which were not brought to the Bundeskartella because probably they were anti-competitive and because of this tool they were not even filed uh, with us uh, in, in Bonn. Um, there were also big cases, um, uh, the biggest one uh, was Meta Customer, uh, which we had under scrutiny where well, the key difficulty was not so much um, the transaction value, but the domestic impact, uh, which led to the fact in the very end that we had parallel proceedings in Bonn and in Brussels with regard uh, to this merger. But again, it was, um, it was not easy to find out if this domestic uh, impact was given or not, a problem that you have in many cases, uh, which, is, which is not, not all new. Um, I think um, it is good to have such a tool um, on a formal basis in order to be able to catch likely killer acquisitions or reverse killer acquisitions, uh, whatever it is. But I think we should not only look at this. Um, I think we also should look at the question if our substantial tests, our substantial criteria are still up to date especially in the, in, the digital, um, in the digital agenda. If you look at the standard of proof uh, that has been set by European courts on the one side, by German courts on the other side, not so much in the digital sector, but in very normal areas mm -hmm. like telecommunication uh, at the European level, or even in Germany with regard to furniture industries, I must say the, 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 the bar is quite high in order to prohibit a merger. And what, what we are thinking is about a proposal if we um, also maybe need new statutory tests, for example, for companies that are subject to Section 19A in the German mm -hmm. law uh, that hold a paramount uh, position with regard to competition across markets. So. Um, the formal step is one, one side, of course. I think here um, the transaction value threshold serves the purpose, but I think for the future we have to, to think further. Here again, Meta Customer is a good example because we did not see how to block it because the prognosis that we, have, that we would have uh, to take 
it was quite uncertain and it was in the long run uh, so that was difficult and this is why in the very end we said we, we cleared it uh, with some uh, some yeah some bad conscience maybe no that's a uh, that's very interesting and if I may yes yeah, as an economist I'm not wholly surprised that most of the cases were in the pharmaceutical industry because the original uh, academic contribution that sparked uh, the killer acquisition uh, debate was indeed in the pharmaceutical sector rather than in the digital sector. Yeah, yeah. But let me move to digital markets because obviously, you know, digital markets are under um, the lens uh, and they've been uh, for some time. So you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you very recently stated at the uh, Fordham Law Conference, I believe, that uh, there is a competition aspect to big tech um, collection of uh, uh, enormous amounts of data. Uh, so I have a, a two-part question for you on this. The first one is whether by that statement do you mean that the acquisition of data by big tech companies creates barriers to entry um, or expansion of competitors and therefore um, is a competition problem in that sense or do you mean that the conduct per se could be seen as an antitrust violation? Um, and then the second part of the question is, depending on what is your answer, what is the solution to, to that issue? Well, to, a too difficult question. Um, maybe question two is more difficult. What is the solution? As to question one, I don't think that the gathering processing of data is a problem in itself, also not with regard to competition. I think we all benefit from these data-driven uh, business models. We see data-driven innovations. Uh, we see the design of new products and services uh, based on data. We see a better understanding of customer needs based on data again. So that is not the problem. I think there is a, a large beneficial part to this. But on the other hand, what we also know is data, the gathering, the processing of data can be used to stifle competition. It can be used as a barrier to entry. We all know about the three Vs, um, velocity, variety, and, and volume. I mean, these companies, they collect data from all thinkable sources in the internet, in the web, variety. Um, they collect this data in real time. You, you cannot be faster, velocity. Um, and um, they collect data where whatever you do in the internet volume. So my question is, whoever on earth shall match this? I know that data can be bought. I know that data is available, but not in the sense of these three Vs, that data is at hand for big tech, for these kind of companies. So this is uh, what I see, and this is why I believe that data can, of course, problems with regard to competition. So if you combine that now with other competition parameters, and here I come, for example, to a survey that we have done um, on uh, online advertising just recently. And uh, if you look at the findings uh, that we have made here, that online advertising is an extremely complex me me um, mechanism, highly automated. Um, very many technical services. If you see that a company like Google is present in all technical markets that you can think of in online advertising, if you think of the fact that online advertising is quite an opaque business model, indeed, nobody really knows what is happening inside the box. Google does, but not many others. And if you think of the fact that a company like Google uh, also owns very interesting uh, websites to dispatch uh, online advertising. And if you combine this with the data that, that Google, for example, is holding, then you might have a case um, because there you really can see um, how one company um, has all the tools at hand, including the data you need in order to, to drive a um, very successful online uh, advertising business model, uh, then you can see what this can do to competition. So 
This is really an interesting perspective uh, for me because sometimes we thought if we would ever do a case in this area, um, as a competition agency, you always think about remedies. What would be the remedies in, in order to, and here I come to the question of the solution. And um, sometimes I'm afraid that you might impose a remedy here and then another company makes use of a parameter there and then you, you run after that and then they find another parameter to turn and um, that you never find the right remedy. And here again, we were in close contact at a G7 meeting uh, in Bonn uh, of the data protection agencies. And I, what I found extremely interesting is what they think. They think about data minimizing. Uh, also because of the fact that they see that so much data has never been made use of. Um, and um, maybe this is something one can benefit from because sometimes I'm really wondering um, if we should really allow these companies to collect data to that amount, to an amount that Tim Cook, uh, the CEO of Apple said, what is happening here, he said uh, with regard to Facebook, is military profiling. So is this really what we want? And this is, that goes beyond competition. Is this really what we want? Uh, that we want military profiling in order to make you buy the right suit or the right car. Is this what we need and what we want as a society? You know? I think these are very interesting, not only competition questions, but also almost ethical questions about this area and how to deal with it, besides the fact that to find the right solution for competition is not an easy task, as you see. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Um, let me then move to a completely different topic, but one that is uh, definitely topical is uh, we are possibly in the third crisis of um, a decade or more, you know, from the financial crisis to the COVID crisis. Now we have this uh, energy and price and inflation crisis. And um, it's probably um, the worst uh, energy crisis since the 70s. Now, the usual solution of the competition law um, world is to go at it uh, through state aid. Obviously, that's not within the remit of national competition authorities. So, so is there something that national competition authorities can do to help with the current crisis, which is at the forefront of most people's yeah. mind? I fully agree. It's really a multifold crisis. I mean, it, it started with the pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, it went on with the war in Ukraine. It went on with the energy crisis, with inflation, uh, with the interruption of supply chain. Again, that is COVID-driven. So we are really confronted uh, with many crises. Well, to be very clear, inflation is, in fact, not a problem of competition agencies. Um, inflation is the problem of the European Central Bank. In, in fact, it's just as easy as that. Um, which does not mean that there might not be a link between inflation and competition law. Um, I think what we might see if we would really do an in-depth survey is that we, we might see that inflation is even higher maybe in concentrated markets because in concentrated markets you might find companies who have the power to set prices and who might make use of this price setting power in, in these times. Price abuse cases, on the other hand, are difficult. Um, the Bundeskartellamt is one of, these, of, the, of the agencies that has done these uh, abusive price cases um, with regard to gas supplies in Germany. Um, we have uh, cared for a monetary compensation of consumers. Um, of more than 100 million euros. Uh, with regard to the Berlin water provider, uh, we have taken care that the consumer is handed back hundreds of millions by this water provider, provider because we found that the prices were abusively high. And the same was true in the case of district heating suppliers. But all these companies held a monopoly, and we saw that they abused their monopoly. But I must also spell out a very clear warning. This is not a tool to fight inflation. These are very rare, very complex cases. They take a long time, by the way. Many of them go to court. Um, so this is not, uh, this is not the, wolf, uh, the way forward. 
In competition agencies, in fact, there are not agencies to control the price. We control competition and we hope and we know that competition takes care of low prices. So here we cannot really benefit very much. What we can do um, from my perception is advocacy. We can make ourselves heard also with regard to the business community and this is what we do. We looked at certain price issues. Um, we, we look at the fuel prices, by the way, by sector inquiry, because we saw that there was a gap between the price for crude oil on the one side and, for, and the price at the petrol station. And this gap has enlarged over time. So th that was a good reason for us to make a sector inquiry with regard to fuel prices and what is happening at the level um, of the refineries uh, and so on. We will present first results of this sector inquiry uh, in, in November. So that is what we can do. This is one thing. The other thing that I see is, of course, in a crisis, you see lots of cooperations between companies. And uh, you can try to accompany this. We, we did that in, in two cases just recently. Uh, one were the sugar producers who came to us and said they want to cooperate with regard to possible gas shortages in the future. So they wanted to make sure that they can work properly. We thought that was a, a, uh, that was a cooperation uh, not, to, not to, or, or to clear, so to say because we saw what an increase of the price of sugar would do to the value chain afterwards. But it was a cooperation limited to the necessary, temporary and uh, proportionate as always. Another cooperation was the um, establishment of the LNG terminal uh, in Wilhelmshaven in Brunsbüttel, where it, it, it every, every hour counts, so to say, So and we wanted this to go on quickly. So we also agree to this cooperation, although it is combined with an exclusive access of some companies to these LNG terminals, again during a limited period of time. But in, in extraordinary times, um, also at a, as a competition agency, you need to take extraordinary decisions. By the way, this is very important to me. It does not mean that you are more lenient. Um, it means that you look at the economic environment and that you look at the changes of the competitive structure of the market and that you react to this and that you really make competition law a breathing law with, uh, with regard to these um, extravagant circumstances. And this is how we can, how we can act. Everything else you might read in the, um, in the uh, statement of the ICN steering group uh, where we said that uh, we will not be lenient in these times. Competition is still the way forward and if we want to get out of these crises safe and sound, we, that will only happen if competition is established also by competition agencies. And we want to make governments aware that whatever response they take, Competition must always be a part of it, always be a part of this response. So uh, you should read it carefully. It's not very long, just four pages, and uh, you can see what's in there. Will do. Thank you very much. This has been illuminating. Thank you for participating in this podcast. Thank you.